How would you like to pay $9 million for a three-bedroom high-rise condominium only to move in and discover your building was sinking into the ground? Hello, I'm Tim Saxton. Welcome to Whitehorse Media. Stay tuned to find out more. Many of you may have heard about the incredible sinking tower in San Francisco. In 2008, developers built the Millennium Skyscraper, a beautiful 58-story building containing condominiums selling for up to $9 million each. Then it was discovered that the tower was sinking. You see, it had been built upon the ruins of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. As such, the building did not have a solid footing and began to sink and to tilt. To solve the problem, it was proposed to sink 12 deep piers or shafts down through the ruins of the old city to bedrock so that stability could be obtained. Developers certainly would not want to see in San Francisco what happened some years ago in China, when construction crews showed up for work only to discover that their recently constructed apartment building had toppled over. Again, poor planning and development were blamed. Yet it is plain to see from these examples that there are important factors to consider in constructing a building, so that what you build will last. The Bible also speaks of building, as we find in our text today, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, where it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the foundation for all spiritual building in our lives. He is the bedrock, you might say, and we must have our shafts anchored in Him. Today, we want to consider what it means to build as revealed in the Bible. What does the Bible reveal about the most important building project of all? No, this is not a study of bricks and mortar, but of something deeply more significant for it is the ultimate construction project. Let us open our Bibles to discover what God's Word says about building the city of God. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to open your Word once again. And we pray for the blessing of your Holy Spirit as we study this important topic today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible records a number of individuals considered as builders. Some were wise, like the man who built his house on the rock, and others foolish, like the man who built on the sand. In this study, we will examine four of the more notable builders in the Bible, all of whom were, were wise. The first on our list is Solomon, the son who built the house of God. You may remember the story about King David who desired to build a temple for the Lord. Later, he was instructed by God that he could not build the temple. Instead, he was told that his son would build the temple. Solomon did build a temple of great fame, both for its magnificence and wealth. Solomon's temple was unrivaled in its beauty. No building has been built since like it. One interesting aspect of the construction of Solomon's temple was its quiet nature. The Bible says in 1 Kings 6 verse 7, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Notice here that the stones were made ready prior to their assembly in the house. Did you know the Bible refers to you and I as stones of a house as well? 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In like manner, God works in the lives of men and women, preparing them to receive of His Spirit before they are even brought into His house. This text refers to to the hewing and squaring the Lord does on each heart as He prepares individuals for His work and His kingdom. Now, Scripture tells us that upon completion of the building, Solomon had a great dedication service and brought up the Ark of the Covenant to take its place 
in the temple of God. You may remember the ark had been abiding in a tent in Israel until this time. 2 Chronicles 5 and verse 2 tells us, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Now what did the ark symbolize? It symbolized the presence of God. Chapter 5 and verse 3 tells us, Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the seventh month. The dedication of the temple took place in the seventh month. Now what is significant about the seventh month? What happened in Israel in the seventh month? The seventh month was when the day of judgment or the day of atonement occurred. A closer study will reveal the dedication of the temple took place during the time of of the Day of Atonement. Verse 5 says, And they brought up the ark, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. At the time of the Day of Atonement, the ark denoting the presence of God, along with the holy vessels, were brought into the Lord's house, which was prepared for them. Verse 12 says, also the Levites, which were the singers, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, and having cymbals and psalteries and harps, and with them a hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Notice in this story of Solomon who has built the temple of God that the temple is finished, the house of God is complete, and the ark representing the presence of God is brought into the place prepared for it. The holy vessels likewise are brought into the place prepared for them in the house of God. As the presence of God enters, those arrayed in white linen and having the harps of God are singing and the trumpets are blowing. Does that sound like a symbolic scenario to you? Perhaps of another time when those who are vessels are brought into the house of God and the Spirit of God fills His people? In the story of Solomon, he is the son who builds the house. Now, who does Solomon represent in this story? In Scripture, who ultimately is the son who builds the house of God? Solomon represents Christ, and the house represents both the people of God and their heavenly home. The second builder we want to look at is Zerubbabel. In Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible is speaking about Zerubbabel. And it says, Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's the background to this story. God's people had come out of Babylon. We might say the word had gone forth, Come out of her, my people and it was time to rebuild the house of God that had been broken down. And this rebuilding would be accomplished not by human power, but by the Spirit of God. In verse 8 we read, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts, hosts hath sent me unto you. Now, who lays the foundation of the house of God and then likewise finishes it? It is Jesus. In Zechariah, it says that Zerubbabel lays the foundation stone and Zerubbabel finishes the house. In other words, Zerubbabel was both the beginning of the work and the end of the work. And the house is built not by might or human power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. In the second example, we find Zerubbabel representing Christ, the one who builds the house of God. 
Our third builder to consider today is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the builder of the walls. Now the story of Nehemiah takes place after, long after Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Many years later, King Artaxerxes has come to the throne of the Medo-Persian Empire, and he orders the rebuilding of the city under Ezra the priest. In the book of Ezra, you find the story how the people went back and started rebuilding. But 13 years later, we come to the time of Nehemiah, who at the time was working in the service of the king. Now, he, Nehemiah meets a messenger who has recently come from the city of Jerusalem. And the messenger says to Nehemiah, reading from chapter 1 and verse 3, the remnant that are left there, that is the remnant left in Jerusalem that went back to build the city, he says, the messenger says, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Apparently in the 13 years since Ezra's return, local enemies had come and again broken down the walls and burned the gates, for they did not want to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Continuing on, and it came to pass, when I heard these words, said Nehemiah, that I sat down and wept and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You can see the, the agony of soul that Nehemiah faced as he heard that his precious, beloved home city of Jerusalem was a, broken down again. Nehemiah's troubled countenance came before the king, who listened to the, to the distress of his servant and asked, what do you propose to do? Nehemiah answered in verse 5, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my fathers, that I may build it. And that is exactly what the king did. So Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, gathered the people, and said to them, reading from chapter 2 and verse 7, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Verse 18, Nehemiah says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. And they said, Let us arise and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. This, bring us, this brings us to the first summary fact that we want to look at in the book of Nehemiah. And that is this, Nehemiah, during a time of trouble and persecution of God's people, proposes to rebuild the walls. Now, the devil did not want the walls rebuilt. He wanted the people held in affliction so they would not be able to fulfill God's purposes for them. We find trouble coming as Nehemiah proposes to build the walls. In chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, But when Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Gershon the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? In fact, in chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, They mocked them. You can't rebuild the walls. You're doing this in violation of the king's authority, and we are going to report you. Now, the king had originally ordered the walls to be built, but notice how the enemies of God attempted to flip the case around and make it appear that God's people were in the wrong for trying to do what is right. Do you think similar things could ever happen in our day? In verse 20, Nehemiah answered them and said, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. In chapter 4 and verse 6, we read, we read, So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Thus, under threats and imprecations, the wall starts coming together. But it came to pass, we read in verse 7, that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem. Have you ever noticed in Scripture how the enemies of God's people always attempt to surround Jerusalem and to fight against it? Why is that? What does Jerusalem represent in Scripture? A little later in our study, we will see that Jer Jerusalem is not simply a physical city. It also is symbolic for the people of God. 
Nehemiah 4 verse 13 tells us how Nehemiah set in the lower places behind the wall the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. In other words, they were armed for the work they were prepared to do. In verse 18, for the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded. And he that had the trumpet, said Nehemiah, was by me. Do we have our swords by our sides today? In scripture, what does the sword represent? It represents the word of the living God. As Christians, we are to have the word of God to do the work that we have been given to do. In Nehemiah 4, verse 19 and 20, Nehemiah says, I said unto the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort you hither unto us, and our God shall fight for us. Notice here what Nehemiah was saying. The work is great, and in comparison we are few. Therefore, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, Converge on that place and do the work of God, and God will take care of us. Could there be a lesson in that illustration for God's people today at the end of time? This brings us to our second fact in the book of Nehemiah, that the walls are built as God's people, armed with their swords and resorting to the sound of the trumpet, conduct the word of God, the work of God. In chapter 6 and verse 10, Nehemiah says, Afterwards I came into the house of Shemaiah, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay you. Yea, in the night they will come to slay you. Here we find that fear is being used to keep Nehemiah from his work. But Nehemiah responds, Should such a man as I flee? and would go into the temple to save his life, I will not go in. And lo, I perceived, he said, that God had not sent him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin, and that they might have, an, they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. Have you noticed how the devil uses fear to try to keep God's people from doing the work before them? Fear often comes from a lack of complete trust in God. But notice how Nehemiah did not let fear stop him. He went forward anyway. Sometimes we, as God's end-time people, must learn the same lesson. A story is told from Africa many years ago. One day Joan had to accompany her husband to a distant village, taking their little baby girl with them. They stayed in an empty hut, while her husband visited villages even more remote. Beside Joan were two native mission boys that had come to assist. While waiting in the hut, Joan's baby became very ill. It actually contracted jungle fever. Quickly, Joan sent one of the native helpers to go find her husband and urge him to return. As Joan waited for her husband, the baby grew worse, and Joan knew that the baby needed medical attention or she would die. It was night and there was only Joan, the sick baby, and one native helper. Joan was terrorized of the thought of going into the jungle at night without her husband and defenseless. But what to do? Her baby's life was on the line. So praying, she, she told the native helper, get ready, we are going to the jungle mission station tonight. Love for another spurred her to move forward regardless of her fears, and thus her baby was saved. In doing God's work, oftentimes the devil attempts to paralyze us with our fears, holding us back from what needs to be done. But in the end, God's people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will rise above their fears and go forth anyway, resulting in the saving of the lost. Thus, fact number three is that fear was used in an attempt to keep God's people from completing their work. Nehemiah 6.15 says, So the wall was finished in 52 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Is there a time coming when God's enemies will see that God has taken the reins into his own hands? 
The story of the building of the wall in Nehemiah's day is really the story of the building of God's church or His last day people at the end of time. The challenges faced by Nehemiah and Israel are the same as that will be faced by God's people in the end. But there are some other important aspects in the book of Nehemiah which also points us to last day events. Let's look at fact number four. It was a time to review the books. In Nehemiah 7 and verse 5 we read, And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. Now in the past many people had returned from Babylon and intermarried with local pagans. It was hard to tell who was part of the children of Israel and who wasn't. So a reckoning took place in which the books of record were opened and a review was made to see if your name was written in the books. All were reckoned or reviewed, including the priests, and it says some were not found. In verse 64 it says, These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore were they as polluted put from the priesthood. In the final building up of God's people, is there a review taking place of the books of heaven? Are people's names being compared with what is written in the books? Will those whose names are not found be ineligible to be priests of God and of Christ in the holy city? Fact number five, the time of Nehemiah was also a time of sealing. Nehemiah 10 verse 1 describes a list of individuals who were sealed in a covenant to keep the commandments of God, including the seventh-day Sabbath. Those who were sealed in the covenant also separated themselves from the wicked inhabitants of the land and enjoined themselves under the law of God. Fact number six, it was a time of bringing in the harvest offerings for God. In verse 39 of Nehemiah 10 we read, for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine and the oil, unto the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters, and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. In the book of Joel, the corn, the new wine, and the oil are used as examples to illustrate the time of the latter rain. Is there a time coming when the latter rain harvest will be brought into the house of God? Yes, there is. Fact number seven. The time of Nehemiah was the time for the dedication of the walls and for a loud cry to be made. In verse 27, we read, At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the, to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing. Verse 31, Then I brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall, and appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks. In verses 41 and 42, it describes seven priests who were given seven trumpets, and it states the singers sang loud. And in verse, verse 43, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. Imagine the joy of Jerusalem being heard far away, far and near, for the great shout that the people was giving, the music that was coming, the joy of the people. Fact number eight, the time of Nehemiah was also a time of the cleansing of the sanctuary. In chapter 13 and verse 4 we read, And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Now you may remember Tobiah was one of the enemies of God's people. And he had allied himself with the high priest there in the temple. And it says in verse 5, And he, that's the high priest, had prepared for him, that is Tobiah, a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil. In verse 7, And I came to Jerusalem, and I understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither I brought again the vessels of the house of God. 
So the house of God was cleansed. The sanctuary was cleansed so they could bring vessels, the corn, the new wine, and the oil into the house. Fact number nine. It was a time to return to the true Sabbath. In verse 15 it says, In those days saw I, that's Nehemiah speaking, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and I testified against them. Here Nehemiah sees the people disregarding God's seventh day Sabbath. And it says in verse 17, And I contend with the nobles of Judah and said, What evil thing is this, do, is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Thus Nehemiah brought the people back to worship God on his seventh day Sabbath. Fact number 10. It was a separation from false women. In verse 23 we read, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. And I smote certain of them, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. In Scripture, a woman represents a church. Thus, a false woman represents a false church. Is there a time coming when God's true people in the fallen churches are given the call, Come out of her, my people, and be separate, and touch not the unclean thing? The book of Nehemiah concludes in verse 30 of chapter 13, Thus cleansed I them from all strangers. Now Nehemiah in this story is the builder of the walls, the one who calls people back to the true Sabbath who says to separate from error, who reviews the books and cleanses the sanctuary. Who does Nehemiah represent in this story? Do we see how Nehemiah and the building of the wall of Jerusalem represents the time of the final building of the people of God and how Nehemiah is a symbol for Christ in the story? Our fourth builder that we want to look at today is Ezekiel. Now Ezekiel was not truly a builder as the prior three. But we are counting him today as a builder or perhaps as an architect as the Lord gave him a detailed vision about how Jerusalem, the city of God, should look. In chapter 40 and verse 2 of Ezekiel, it says, In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. In verse 4, Ezekiel is told to declare all that you see to the house of Israel. So Ezekiel is given this picture of what the city of Jerusalem is supposed to look like. In chapter 43 and verse 2, we read, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the voice of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And the Spirit took me up. Verse 5, And brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Notice in these two verses that in Ezekiel's vision, the earth shines with His glory, and the glory of God fills the house. In this chapter, Ezekiel's told, Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. Now, who is the house of Israel? It's God's people. And who is the pattern? Is there a time coming when God's people will be ashamed of their iniquities? When the Lord will remind them to measure the pattern? Who is that pattern? It is Jesus Christ. When the church is terribly shaken, then in reflection and, re and repentance will the Lord reveal himself to his people. Like Isaiah when he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Or like Joshua standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments, God's people in a time of coming crisis will catch a glimpse of the holiness and beauty of God's character and will plead for purity of heart to be like Him. They will see their Savior as never before, who is their perfect pattern. Now, in Ezekiel 47, verse 7, we find a change taking place in his vision. It says, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and on the other. At this point, Ezekiel's vision seems to morph from the earthly city to the heavenly city, much as God's people 
who are being built upon this earth will one day morph from the corruptible to the incorruptible. Verse 12 says, And and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, and the leaf shall be for medicine. Hmm. Trees with fruit bearing every month, and the leaves are medicine for the people. Verse 31 says, And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the children of Israel. Does that sound familiar? Verse 20 says, speaking of the holy oblation or the portion of the city being four square. Where else in the Bible do we hear of a city being four square? Verse 35 says, the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. What city is this? There can only be one. Ezekiel is now seeing the holy city, New Jerusalem. We read in Revelation 21, verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 11 says, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Verse 12, And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Here we see that matching counterpart to Ezekiel. Here the holy city, New Jerusalem, has the names of the twelve tribes over the gates. Verse 16, And the city lies four square. Mm. Another comparison to Ezekiel. The length, the breadth, and the height of it are equal. My favorite Christian author puts it this way, The church is the bride, the lamb's wife. Every true believer is a part of the body of Christ. Now, The New Jerusalem is described as the Bride of Christ. But it is not Christ's physical living bride, for after all, the New Jerusalem is made of heavenly stone or inanimate material. However, she is represented as Christ's bride, as the church is represented as Christ's bride. Why is that? Because everything about the New Jerusalem is made to represent the saved or the redeemed. It represents their transformed character. How does it do this? Well, let's consider some ways. We're told the city, the New Jerusalem, is 12,000 furlongs on every side, the Bible says, revealing perfect symmetry. The wall is 144 cubits tall. Why is that? 144 is 12 times 12, again, perfect symmetry. Likewise, in speaking of perfect symmetry, we find God's last day people represented as the 144,000 being 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, symbolically speaking. The city is made of transparent gold or clear glass, revealing the transparency of God's character or His law and the transformed character of the redeemed. The city is made up of jewels. In the book of Malachi, God likens the saved to his jewels. In John 14, 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Notice that it is Christ who is preparing the mansions in the New Jerusalem. It is Christ who is the builder of the city. In Hebrews 11, 16, we read, But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. The new Jerusalem is the city God prepares for his bride. The church, whom he builds on earth to take to heaven. Ephesians 2, 20 says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. As Christ is the builder of the city of God in heaven, he is the builder of his church here upon the earth, and we are built upon his foundation. In verse 21 it says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. When Christ's church is ready upon earth, then the homes of the redeemed are ready in heaven. And Christ's people are brought into Christ's place that he has prepared for them. In like manner, as Christ is building his church on earth, he sees that many of his sheep are in other folds, and he longs for the time when he will make them all one. That time will come when the people are ready, 
and the church is ready, and Christ will bring all his people from the other folds into his one church on earth, and it is this unified group that will go into their heavenly abode. Perhaps you're asking yourself today, how can I be part of God's last day church? How can I be made a fit vessel or a fit stone to be in his kingdom? We are told that at the end of time, God's people will be pleading with God for purity of heart which means they are praying to be made into fit vessels. The change of our heart starts with placing our total confidence in Christ, in believing that what he says applies to us personally. Often it is easy for people to think, well, the promises of God are for this one or for that one, but are they for me? Yes, they are, brothers and sisters. We are to believe that what Christ says applies to us, and then manifest that belief. Then in trusting Him, in trusting Christ to change our hearts, we follow His Word completely. As we move, for, move forward in faith, spending time with Christ daily in His Word, He will so shape us and fit us to be the stones or vessels for His kingdom. We have this promise in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. As Christ will finish the city of God for his people, so he will finish preparing his people for the city of God. Psalm 138, verse 8 reads, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. And in the end, God will have a fit people prepared for the holy city he has prepared. Malachi 3, 7 says, And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. So we see in these builders of the Bible, Solomon, Zerubbabel, and Nehemiah, that they are all symbols of Christ and of his building of the city of God or of his last day church on earth. In Ezekiel's vision, we see the pattern of what it is supposed to be which is modeled after the heavenly pattern. Brothers and sisters, Christ is both the foundation and the master builder. He is building both a church and a city. And when one is complete, so is the other. And he returns to place his people into his city, or we should say their city, for Christ has prepared it for them, for it reflects their experience. Do you want to be made up as a stone or a vessel for that beautiful holy city? A story is told, taking place in the middle of Africa near the mountains of the moon, a small 50-member Seventh-day Adventist church was located near a river's edge. Every Sabbath, the church family came together to worship in their church, which was made of sticks and mud and a grass-thatched roof. Next to the church was a road that led from the Congo to Uganda. Across the road was a large, beautiful church building where other believers worshipped every Sunday. As the Adventists looked upon the church across the road, they dreamed of having a beautiful structure like that. If only we had a nicer church, a member said one day. Let's pray, said another. Let's pray that God will give us stones so we can build a nice, solid church. So they prayed. Now, an individual who attended the Sunday church across the street heard about the Adventists praying for stones to build a new church, and he laughed at them. You think God will rain stones from heaven, he mocked? God will answer our prayers, and he will send us stones, was the Adventist reply. Many of the believers in the church across the street acted the same way. They mocked and made fun of this little company of Adventists who were praying for stones to build a church. But the Adventists were not deterred. They knew God would hear and answer their prayers. A few days later, the sky grew dark, and a terrible storm swept down upon the area. It was so severe that it bro broke loose large and small boulders, and they came crashing down into the river. Strong winds fl and floods sent rocks d crashing down into the valley. When it all subsided, it was found that the swollen river had deposited a large pile of stones right into the land next to the Adventist church. As it turned out, it was the stones needed for the Adventists to start their building. The church members thanked the Lord and moved the stones to the place where the church was to be built. But now they had another problem. They needed a builder. 
a mason to build the church. So they started praying. They prayed so earnestly for the Lord who had sent the stones to now send a builder. About a day's journey away lived a wealthy builder. He had built many buildings for the government. He heard about the little Adventist church that was praying for a builder. He heard they had prayed for stones and how God had sent them stones, and he sensed God's call to go visit them. Arriving at the site, he was shown the pile of stones that God had supplied. Standing there, looking at the stones, the builder heard the Lord speaking to him. And through the convictions of the Spirit, he knew what God was calling him to do. I will build your church for you, he told the small Adventist congregation. I will build a church large enough to hold a hundred people, which was double their normal size. Oh no, said one of the church members, we want a church that will seat five hundred. But you only have fifty members, said the builder. But the reply was, that's okay. The God who builds the church is the same God who fills the church. Convinced, the builder said, all right, I will build you a church to seat five hundred. So he and his crew went to work, and soon the walls of the church began to go up. Then those across the street who had mocked and made fun of the Adventists saw the gaps closing in the wall and the building taking shape. Soon the beautiful new church was finished, and the people called for the pastor to come and hold a dedication service. Across the street, the members of the Sunday church had noted the progress they had seen in the Adventist church and how God's hand had worked on behalf of their neighbors. I am sorry I made fun of you, said one of the individuals from across the street to an Adventist one day. I can see that God has built you a church. Do not worry, was the reply. It's okay. We're having a dedication service. Would you like to come? May I, he said. So he came to the dedication service of the new church. But not only did he come, but so did all the members of the church across the street. They filled the new Adventist church. It was a beautiful and powerful service. So much so that the next week, the members from across the street returned again. And the following week, they returned again. And they continued to return until they were baptized. And thus the people saw that the God who built the church is the same God who filled the church. Brothers and sisters, the same holds true for us today. The God who is building his church on earth is the same God who will fill his church on earth. Our part is to be a clean vessel to be used by him for the accomplishment of his purpose. Is it your desire today to be that that fit vessel for him? Pray with me as we close. Loving Father in heaven, we hear your voice today, Lord, speaking to us. What an incredible thing you have done, Lord, in revealing through Scripture the wonders of how you are preparing your church on earth, preparing to take us to that place in heaven. Father, we pray you will make us into the fit vessels you desire us to be, those perfect stones shaped and squared that you can place into your building. We know, Lord, the work will not be finished by our might or our strength, but by your Spirit will finish the work. And then your people, Lord, will be made up into that perfect building for you. We also claim your promise, Father, that you will finish the work you have started in our lives, even today, and bring us into your heavenly kingdom. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.